Good evening, uh, Senator Mitchell, uh, Noel, esteemed uh, board members and members of the uh, FBA. Uh, dear guests, thank you so much for joining us tonight for uh, a talk by truly the uh, Professor Emeritus of uh, Crisis Management and, and Conflict Resolution, uh, may, I, uh, may I say that, uh, Senator Mitchell. Um, a few years ago when uh, I was a foreign policy advisor of the uh, Prime, of the now Prime Minister of Hungary, I asked him about, because he was in government uh, previously, I asked him, uh, how, was, how was it being in government? And he said, you know, it's basically continuous uh, crisis management, and on, on a better day, you, on, you only have conflict re resolution. So this is, uh, this is how I remember uh, kind of picking up on, you know, on a larger scale foreign policy a few years ago. Um, I joined the foreign ministry in Hungary in 99, exactly when Hungary joined NATO. And ever since, my country is pretty much uh, part and parcel of everything that the Western uh, Alliance is doing uh, for uh, safeguarding you know, world peace and democracy. Uh, it, I hope it's only a coincidence that actually NATO started the humanitarian campaign in, in Kosovo two weeks after I joined. But <laughs> it nevertheless, taught me a big lesson about that even when you think that you're kind of you know, sitting in a good place and you, you almost feel you arrive, that's exactly when the whole you know, ride begins. And ever since, looking back these 15 years, or you know, on a larger scale, like 20 years, ever, uh, almost 25 years ever since the uh, Cold War has officially ended, uh, I, I think it's pretty much safe to say that conflict resolution has become a very hot topic, and it is something that is becoming most, mostly an arts form and almost a science, how it's being done. Senator Mitchell had such a career in foreign policy that not many people ever can boast of having accomplished, not in one lifetime, but in, in two or three. So it is truly an immense pleasure for us to have him here, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Uh, as a practicing diplomat, there is nothing better than when wisdom comes to you and you don't have to really to go for it very far. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Senator Misha, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, before we bring the senator up, I, uh, I'm Noel Latif. I'm president of the Foreign Policy Association. And I want to thank Consul General Dunn for his hospitality. We're most appreciative. And we are very honored uh, at the Foreign Policy Association to inaugurate today the Hasib Sabag Distinguished Lecture on Diplomacy. Over the past couple of days, I have had, uh, I've been reading about Hasib Sabag's humility, his extraordinary generosity, his can-do spirit, and the deep and affectionate respect accorded to him by many world leaders. President Carter, for example, has written, I have found that Hasib Sabag lacks two human traits, meanness and pettiness. <laughs> Treating bigotry and resentment as impostors, he instead welcomes affirmation and magnanimity. He has turned adversity into a commitment to reconciliation and peace. From being a man without a country, he has become an exemplar for what it means to be a great citizen of the world. Secretary of State Schultz has said, I salute Hasib Sabag for his integrity and his devotion. I am proud to call him a friend. His daughter, Sana, is with us today, and she has shared with me her father's vision of peaceful coexistence between Palestinians and Israelis. Hasib Sabag rightly took great pride in Sana, and we are grateful to her for establishing this lecture in honor of her father. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to invite Sana to introduce Senator George Mitchell. Sana Sabah. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Senator George Mitchell at the inaugural lecture on diplomacy named to my father at the Foreign Policy Association. My father greatly admired Senator Mitchell. Like my father, Senator Mitchell has always been a statement 
a statesman of great integrity and vision. The senator most recently served as U.S. Special Envoy for the Middle East Peace from January 2009 to May 2011. Prior to that, he had a distinguished career in public service. He was appointed to the United States Senate in 1980. Senator Mitchell went on to an illustrious career in the Senate spanning 15 years. He left the, the Senate in 1995 as the Senate Majority Leader. Senator Mitchell enjoyed bipartisan respect during his tenure. For six consecutive years, he was voted the most respected member of the Senate by a bar bipartisan group of senior congressional aides. While in the Senate, <coughs> Senator Mitchell served on the Finance, Veterans Affairs, and Environmental and Public Works Committees. He was a leader in opening markets to trade and led the Senate to ratification of the North American Free Trade Agreement and creation of the World Trade Organization. In 1995, he served as a special advisor to President Bill Clinton on Ireland, and from 1996 to 2000, he served as the independent chairman of the Northern Ireland Peace Talks. Under his leadership, the Good Friday Agreement, a historic accord ending decades of conflict, was agreed to by the governments of Ireland and the United Kingdom and the political parties of Northern Ireland. For his service in Northern Ireland, Senator Mitchell received new, numerous awards and honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor given by the US government, the Philadelphia Liberty Medal, the Truman Institute Peace Prize, and the United Nations UNESCO Peace Prize. In 2001 and to, in 2000 and 2001, at the request of President Clinton, Prime Minister Ehud Barak, and Chairman Arafat, Senator Mitchell served as chairman of an international find, fact-finding committee on violence in the Middle East. The committee's recommendation, widely known as the Mitchell Report, was endorsed by the Bush administration, the European Union, and by many other governments. Senator Mitchell served as chairman of the global board of the law firm DLA Piper, chairman of the board of directors of the Walt Disney Company, and a member of the board of the Boston Red Sox. He also served for 10 years as the Chancellor of Queen's University of Northern Ireland, as President of the Economic Club of Washington, and as Chairman of the International Crisis Group. Senator Mitchell has been able to bridge cultures with enormous ease and to great effect. Perhaps his background has helped him in this regard with his own heritage, half Lebanese and half Irish, it gives me great pleasure and honor to invite Senator George Mitchell to deliver the inaugural Hasib Sabag Distinguished Lecture on Diplomacy. Thank you very much, Thank you. Very generous. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sana, for that very generous introduction. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, Noel Latif, members of the Foreign Policy Association and uh, friends. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be asked to deliver the inaugural address uh, at a series named after Hasib Sabah. He was a highly successful businessman building what has become one of the largest construction companies in the world. He was a active promoter of education in the Middle East, in the United States, and elsewhere uh, as a necessary ingredient to peace and prosperity. And he was a tireless advocate for peace in the Middle East as the only way to achieve uh, both nonviolence and prosperity. And so, Sana, I'm grateful to you and to Noel for asking me to join you here. For me, who 
speaks often, the highlight of the evening is always the introduction. Uh, and I have to say, Sana, that was extremely nice of you. Uh, there is a risk to hearing such introductions uh, many times because you might start to believe some of what's said. And so I like to begin with a story about an introductions and uh, how I was brought down to earth. Uh, I spent five years in Northern Ireland, and when I completed my work there, I returned to the United States, wrote a book, and when the book was published, I set out on a book promotion tour around the United States to promote its sales. I received many invitations, and in the process, I learned, interestingly, that in the United States, there are more Irish-American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> and I got invited to everyone. Uh, I couldn't accept them all, but I went to many. And as I traveled the country speaking to these Irish American groups, there developed an informal competition among the groups as to who could give the most extravagant, the longest, often the most ridiculous introduction. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, leaving me hardly any time to speak. The proper reaction, of course, would have been to demonstrate some humility, to ask them to keep it short, but I had an improper reaction. I kind of liked it, <laughs> so I encouraged them. I gave them information that they otherwise didn't know, uh, and when they left something out, I scolded them. One guy took 35 minutes to introduce me, and when I get up, I pointed out that he had forgotten that when I graduated from high school in Maine, I received the science award in the senior, <laughs> my senior year. So by the time I got to the last stop, it was in Stamford, Connecticut, the Stamford, Connecticut Irish American Society. I was very impressed with myself. My head was swollen and I, so much that I had a hard time squeezing it, it through the front door. But when I get in, I immediately was uh, approached by an elderly woman who was very excited. She rushed up to me, shook my hand vigorously, and told me how thrilled she was to meet me. She said, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove three and a half hours just to come here, to have the privilege of shaking your hand, telling you what a great man you are, you've done so much for our country, and he asked you, please, would you autograph my poster? She handed me a poster, like a political poster with a big picture on it, and I looked at it and I said, I'm happy to autograph your poster, but before I do, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big picture of Kissinger. She said, you're not? She said, well, who are you anyway? <laughs> and when I told her, she said, why, that's terrible. She said, I came here to meet a great man named Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to ease your pain. She said, well, there is. I said, what is it? And she leaned forward, and I leaned forward. Our foreheads were practically touching. She said, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> she said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name to my poster? So I did. Now here's the best part of the story. About a year ago, Henry and I appeared together. We have often, not very far from here, at, at a, one of these private clubs in a high-rise building in New York. And uh, he and I and a moderator had a conversation about world affairs, Middle East, China, so forth. And I thought it'd be a good time to tell this story, which I did. The audience liked it, and I guess you got a kick out of it. When we left, he and I found ourselves on the elevator going down together. And he said, boy, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I've heard you speak often. Majority leader, we've appeared together, speeches. He said, I have never heard you give a better talk than you did tonight. <laughs> I said, really? I said, was it my answer on China? Or the Middle East? No, 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 no. He said, it was that story you told in the beginning. <laughs> he said, you should tell that all over America. <laughs> and I have, so now I can check off the Foreign Policy, Policy Association of New York and report it to Henry. Well, I want to tell one more story. When Sana and Noah got in touch with me about speaking here, uh, 
the Foreign Policy Association, which I've been at before, so I know it's people who are knowledgeable, many of them expert in the area of foreign policy, I was a little reluctant to accept because I have always been intimidated by speaking to an audience in which the members of the audience know more about the subject than you do. But then I recalled my first day in the Senate. Uh, I entered the Senate in unusual circumstances. I was serving as a federal judge in my home state of Maine when one of Maine's senators, Ed Muskie, was appointed Secretary of State. The governor of Maine then had the authority and did appoint someone to complete Senator Muskie's term. And he announced the day that Muskie announced he was leaving that he wasn't going to take long because it was in the middle of the year, the Senate was in session. He said he was going to hold a press conference the following Monday at noon at the state capitol to announce his choice. A lot of speculation in the press, none of it about me because I'd been appointed a federal judge just the year before. So on that Sunday evening, like most people in Maine, we, we go to bed early in Maine, I went to bed wondering who the governor was going to appoint to the Senate. About 11 o'clock, the phone rang, woke me up. It was the governor calling. He said, I'd like you to come down to the state capitol tomorrow noon so that I can announce that I'm going to appoint you to the U.S. Senate. I said, well, gee, governor, this, uh, that, that's really quite a surprise. I said, I, it's an honor, but look, I got to think about this. I got to talk to my family. I got to get some advice, think about what to do. Well, he said, I'll give you one hour. <laughs> When I protested, he insisted, so I said, okay. I hung up the phone, I immediately called my three older brothers. Uh, we grew up in a very small town in Maine. My three older brothers were very famous athletes, well known not only in our community, but throughout the state. One of my brothers made all New England in basketball. And then I came along and I was not as good an athlete as my brothers. In fact, I was not as good as anybody else's brother. And so in this small town, I began early in life to be known as Johnny Mitchell's kid brother, the one who isn't any good. <laughs> as you might expect, I developed an inferiority complex and a very, very competitive attitude toward my brothers. So when I called them late on that Sunday night, ostensibly to seek their advice, there was a note of triumphalism in my voice. <laughs> I said, guys, the governor just called. He wants to appoint me to the United States Senate. What do you think about that? <laughs> the reaction was completely negative. My brother Johnny said, look, everybody knows you're a born loser. He said, you couldn't possibly win a statewide election. In fact, he said, we can't understand how you got to be a federal judge, so you better stay where you are. My older brother, who thinks he's an intellectual, likes to use the Socratic method. He asks questions to make his point. He said, shouldn't we look at this from the standpoint of the people of Maine? He said, aren't they entitled to have a qualified person representing them in the Senate? And isn't it obvious, he said, that you're not among them? So I hang up the phone. I call the governor. I said, governor, I don't need an hour. I've already received all the assurance I need of my ability to perform as a United States Senator, and I accept your offer. So I, 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 went, to, I went to Washington the next day. I, I went that afternoon, right after the press conference. I went to the airport, flew to Washington. And I get in there about, at the airport at about 5 o'clock. The swearing-in was scheduled for the next morning. And literally on a whim, when I get into the tax cab, I had nothing to do that evening. I said, take me to the Capitol, and I thought I'd go up to the Senate, find the majority leader, then Senator Byrd, who I never met, introduce myself, and kind of get the lay of the land for the swearing in the following day. So I went to the Senate. Uh, I was accompanied by a clerk who took me, and the Senate was in session debating a bill. And it was very crowded. It seemed to me tumultuous. Uh, not too well organized. Uh, so the guy took me in and introduced me to Senator Byrd, told him who I was, and Senator Byrd was very busy dealing with this legislation that they were debating. And he said, okay, uh, well, we'll sway you in right now. I protested. I said, no, 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 the swearing in is tomorrow. Because I, I, I thought 
certainly NBC and ABC would cover it live. <laughs> and I didn't, didn't want to deprive the American people of the opportunity for being, watching me being sworn into the Senate. Look, he said, son, we're very busy here. I said, we'll swear you in now, and that's when we're going to swear you in. Huh? I said, okay. So he interrupted the Senate debate. I was sworn in. It took less than 10 seconds, a profound disillusionment for me. <laughs> Nobody knew what was happening, even senators standing six feet away. And then the Senate resumed debate, and almost immediately a vote occurred. So for those of you interested in political trivia, I hold the all-time record in American history for having cast a vote the shortest time after being a senator. <laughs> Two minutes. And that was the first of many informed judgments I made in your behalf. <laughs> and in behalf of other Americans. So then a guy, the debate, the, the vote ended and a young man rushed up to me, introduced himself as my administrative assistant. I'd never met him, didn't know his name. Turns out he had been Senator Muskie's administrative assistant and now he was mine. And he read off a list of things that I was to do then. And then he said to me, we've got, we're very fortunate, we have a timely, just got an invitation. There are 3,000 certified public accountants meeting at a convention here in Washington. They must have seen you being sworn in on TV. They just called and asked if you would come down and give the keynote address at their convention. I said, I, I said I've always known accountants are very smart but how these guys could have known that I was going to be here and kept this keynote slot open for me. Oh, he said, it's nothing like that. He said, they had four last minute cancellations. He said, you're the only member of Congress they could think of who might not have anything to do tonight. So I said, what do they want me to talk about? He said, the tax code. I said, the tax code? 3,000 CPAs. I don't know anything about the tax code, and you want me to get out and talk to them about it? He got very angry. He said, listen, you're now a United States senator. You will regularly be called upon to speak in public on subjects you know nothing about. <laughs> he said, so if you want to get started and become a really good senator, you get down there and tell the CPAs what's in the tax code, even if you don't know yourself. So I thought, here I am to tell you foreign policy experts about foreign policy. So let's begin. I want to, uh, I'm going to talk about the future, but I want to begin briefly by going back 227 years ago this month, 45 American colonists gathered in Philadelphia in a constitutional convention. Their objectives were independence and self-governance and they achieved both. A decade earlier, they had stated their case for self-governance in the Declaration of Independence. At the convention, they wanted to create a framework of government in which the rights they had claimed in the Declaration could be achieved and safeguarded. The result was the American Constitution. The first 10 amendments, what we call the Bill of Rights, is to me one of the most concise and eloquent statements ever written of the right of the individual to be free from oppression by government. That's one side of the coin of liberty. The other is the need for everyone to have a fair chance to enjoy the blessings of liberty. To a man without a job, to a woman who can't get care or education for her children, to the young people today who lack the skills needed to compete in a world of technology. They don't think much about things like liberty or justice. They worry about coping, getting by one day at a time. The same is true of people who live in societies torn by violence. Without civil order, Concepts like freedom and individual liberty seem unrelated to the daily task of survival because the need for physical security totally dominates their lives. So it was for many years in South Africa, in Central America, in the Balkans, in Northern Ireland, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. And so it is today across a vast swath of the globe from West Asia throughout the Middle East 
in all across Africa. The challenges we face around the world are so many and so controversial that it's difficult for our leaders, indeed for any of us, to think and talk about the future. But for just a few minutes at least, I'd like to do that. Of course, in these brief remarks, I can only touch on some highlights. It took 18 centuries after the birth of Christ for the Earth's population to reach 1 billion, 1,800 years. The most recent billion, the seventh, was added in 13 years. Those are historical facts. Long-term population projections of the future are speculative because they contain many assumptions and also because national policies and cultural changes can affect the direction of population in a relatively short time. And in just, just the last couple of years, there have been numerous books published which present widely different perspectives. So I'm going to use UN figures, but they're subject to the same caveats as all others. The UN's most recent projections are that by the middle of this century, and that's just 36 years away, the world's population will reach about nine and a half billion. It will later peak around 10 billion, then level off and decline steadily over a very long period of time thereafter. Most of the growth will be in Asia and Africa. Of the current world population of just over seven billion, about one in five persons is Muslim, about 1.2 billion. By mid-century, one in three will be Muslim, or about three and a half billion. To put that in perspective, that was the total population of the world as recently as 1970. In the coming decades, the upheavals that we now regard as extraordinary and which so dominate our daily news will be the norm. Growing populations will mean rising demand for natural resources, for political and economic power, all aggravated in many of the affected countries by poor governance and widespread corruption. This volatile mix will be exacerbated in the Muslim world by the internal conflict between Sunni and Shia, which began at Islam's founding nearly 1,400 years ago in the competition to succeed the prophet Muhammad. It was a struggle over power, not over religious differences. Over the past 14 centuries, that conflict has been marked by alternating periods of expansion and remission. It is now in rapid expansion and rising intensity. That is one of two intersecting conflicts that are simultaneously occurring within Islam. The other is between those who wish to establish theocratic, exclusionary states through violence if necessary and to impose their views on everyone else by force if necessary. And the other group, those who wish to establish more open, more tolerant, more inclusionary societies. Both conflicts have deep historical roots. And how they play out in this century is of crucial interest to us, indeed to everyone in the world. Whatever our differences, we must not forget that most people in the Muslim world are much like people everywhere. They want a stable and secure society. They want jobs. They want a place that's healthy and a chance to get their children off to a good start in life. They want personal dignity and they want a voice in their governance. It is in our interest to support those who are trying, often in very difficult circumstances, to build modern, fair, and open societies which provide opportunity for all of their citizens. Our country enjoys many benefits from its status as the dominant world power, but it also incurs many challenges, not least of which is the widespread impression of American omnipotence. When I speak in Asia, I tell this brief story to make a point. A businessman in Karachi gets up one morning, goes in to take a shower, turns on the faucet, and there's no hot water. Ah, he says, Obama, the CIA, again. 
every problem in the world is seen by some as an American problem and susceptible to an American solution. The reality, of course, is that our ability to control events in the world is limited. There are a growing number of pundits and analysts here and elsewhere who, citing that reality, see the United States in a terminal decline. I disagree. We may not be able to fully control events, but we do have unequal power to influence them. And I believe that our power will grow along with our population, which is now estimated by both the UN and the US to reach about 440 million in the middle of this century. I personally see the United States on the brink of a sustained period of renewed economic growth that will expand and extend our dominance well into the future. As our domestic energy production rises and our imports of energy from the Middle East steadily decline, as they are declining now, there will be a resurgence of manufacturing to some extent in our country. And as that occurs, the calculations we make on projecting our power overseas will necessarily change. Power is, of course, relative. And we have a long history of underestimating our strength and overestimating that of our adversaries. There are at least enough people in here that I can just see looking around who remember the presidential campaign of 1984. One of President Reagan's most successful ads was of a huge, scary bear lumbering through the forest. The Russians are coming after us, and they're almost at the shore of New York City. In fact, the Soviet Union was then in the final stages of terminal decline. And in just a few years after that, it ceased to exist. It was absolutely no threat to us in the last few years of its decline. So let's look at some of our competitors now, and starting with Russia, which is very much in the news. 55% of the Russian government's revenues come from taxes on oil and gas. The break-even point for their national budget is oil at or about $110 a barrel. I'm not an expert, but I'm not aware of any experts who believe or expect the price to remain at or above that level at any time in the foreseeable future. They will have severe financial problems over the coming decades. Meanwhile, Russia's population will continue its steady decline, which has been occurring over the past couple of decades. And more importantly, its composition will change as the number of Slavs decline sharply while the number of Muslims within Russia increase, adding to the turmoil that they have faced on their southern border for a very long time. President Putin may succeed in reestablishing dominance over parts of what he calls New Russia, but it will be a costly and a fleeting victory. And neither he nor any Russian leader has any chance to recreate the Soviet empire which existed in the past 50 years. And by mid-century, what happens there won't matter much at all. What happens in China and India will matter. The Chinese population now at 1.3 billion will remain stable at that level through the middle of the century and beyond. But China's problems will not. In 1985, just after Mikhail Gorbachev assumed power, I was one of a small group of senators invited to the Kremlin to meet with him. The subject was the reduction of nuclear weapons, but the discussion, which lasted several hours, was wide-ranging. In the course of it, I asked him whether the Soviet Union could give its citizens free choice in economic affairs while continuing to deny it to them in political affairs. His response was vigorously that he believed the Communist Party could be reformed from within. He was wrong. Boris Yeltsin knew better. Although he was not Gorbachev's equal in intellect, he had a better sense of their politics, and he knew that communism 
had to be swept away completely and a new order created. Is there now a Yeltsin in China? Can they do what the Russians could not? No one knows the answer to those questions. But I do know that despite its enormous capacity and potential, China faces very serious problems. Corruption is epidemic, posing a threat so serious that the country's new leader has gone to extraordinary lengths to create the impression of combating corruption. The rule of law and an independent judiciary, so critical both to individual freedom and to business investment, have not been established firmly in China. Their demand for energy continues to rise, fueling more devastating pollution. I don't know how many of you are aware of recent reports issued by the Chinese government itself, which acknowledge the very widespread problem that is arising from the heavy pollution of the air and water, which stimulate protests, which combined can contribute to destabilization. The Chinese are an energetic and talented people. They have many strengths, and we should admire those strengths. But they face very high hurdles to becoming the world's dominant power. India is already the world's largest democracy. It soon will become the world's largest country. By the middle of this century, there will be 1.8 billion Indians, a full half billion more people than in China. But India faces staggering problems as well. It has an entrenched and slow-moving bureaucracy. It also suffers from widespread corruption. There are a huge number of undereducated and unskilled residents, many of whom live in poverty and hopelessness. India is and will be important precisely because it is the world's largest democracy, and we must do all we can to maintain good and encouraging relations with them, but it is unlikely to become the dominant world power in this century. And so I think American power will continue, and I'm going to come back to that, but I was asked to comment specifically on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict based on my experience there, so I'll do that now. It's a conflict deeply rooted in history, it involves emotional issues like religion, national identity, and territorial competition. It has gone on for so long, has had such destructive effects. The level of mistrust is so high that many there and elsewhere regard it as incapable of solution. But the pursuit of peace is important to the people of the region and to us. It demands our continuing and maximum effort despite the many setbacks. The key to a resolution is easy to state, but extraordinarily difficult to achieve. It is the mutual commitment by Israel and the Palestinians to reach agreement with the active participation of the United States government and the support and assistance of the many other governments and institutions who can and want to help. In a major speech given in Jerusalem in January of 2009, President George W. Bush said, I quote him now, the point of departure for permanent status negotiations is clear. There should be an end to the occupation that began in 1967. The agreement must establish Palestine as a homeland for the Palestinian people, just as Israel is a homeland for the Jewish people. The negotiations must ensure that Israel has secure, recognized, and defensible borders. And they must ensure that the state of Palestine is viable, contiguous, sovereign, and independent. It is vital that each side understands that satisfying the other's fundamental objectives is key to a successful agreement. Security for Israel and viability for the Palestinian state are in the mutual interest of both parties. On taking office in 2009, President Obama publicly reaffirmed that policy. It seemed then that the culture of peace that had been so carefully nurtured through the Oslo process had largely dissipated, replaced by a sense of futility and of the inevitability of conflict. 
Conflict in Gaza had just ended. Palestinians were deeply divided. The uncertainty of Israeli elections lay ahead. Few believed there was any chance for restarting negotiations, let alone reaching an agreement. Unfortunately today, five years later, that remains largely the case. A solution cannot be imposed externally. The parties themselves must negotiate directly. That will require of them compromise and flexibility, and most of all, leadership. Secretary of State Kerry's efforts, commendable and intensive, have so far not proven successful. But I still believe that this conflict can be ended, in part because I'm convinced that the pain they will have to go through to negotiate an agreement, while real and substantial, will be less than the pain they both will have to endure if they do not reach an agreement. If history is any guide, the current interlude won't last. And if the conflict resumes, both sides face very difficult and uncertain futures. Not just the loss of many lives and the destruction of property. There are many other dangers for both. I'll mention just a few. For the Israelis, the first is demography. There are now about six million Jews living in the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. In the same space, there are about five and a half million Arabs, including Israeli Arabs, Palestinians in the West Bank, and Gaza. The Arab birth rate overall is much, much higher. And within just a few years, and I mean literally three or four years, they will be in the majority. Ehud Barak, the former prime minister and defense minister, has spoken often and eloquently on the subject. And he has said that Israel will then have to choose between being a Jewish state or a democratic state because it will not be able to be both if the two-state solution is lost. And he said that is a painful choice that Israel should not have to make. The second challenge to Israel comes from the reality that the only military threat they now face is from rockets. Hamas has thousands of them, crude, lacking in guidance, small and destructive power, but they do create fear and anxiety, and no one can or should doubt that over time, if nothing happens, they'll get more and better rockets. On Israel's northern border, Hezbollah already has many thousands. The public estimates within Israel that it are that Hezbollah possesses between 30,000 and 50,000 rockets. They're somewhat more effective, although limited in range. And before Syria erupted, Hezbollah was engaged in an intense effort to upgrade their systems. And finally, and most threateningly, Iran now has rockets that can reach Israel when launched from Iran itself. While all of the attention has been focused on the nuclear aspect of Iran's projects, it has made the technological leap from liquid fuel to solid fuel rockets, and they now possess an unknown but large number of rockets that can strike anywhere in Israel when launched from Iran itself. They don't yet have the precise guidance systems that will enable them to strike a particular building but they will do massive damage and cause great losses of life in cities if launched. The United States is fully committed to Israel's survival and security, and that commitment is firm and unshakable, whatever the government is in either country. To honor it, we have provided enormous financial and military support to Israel, most recently in the development of an effective anti-missile system. But no one does know or can know whether that or any system could intercept the large number of missiles that might be launched in several directions toward Israel in an all-out conflict. Israel's very existence might then be threatened. Its third challenge is in isolation. It is true that Israel's support in the United States is strong, especially in the Congress and particularly in the House of Representatives but it's declining elsewhere. Some in Israel and in the U.S. are concerned that a Palestinian state might fail 
and be taken over by Hamas. That's a valid concern. But many others believe, as I do, that the collapse of the Palestinian Authority and a takeover by Hamas is more likely in the absence of an agreement than as a result of such an agreement. The fact is that no policy is free of risk. And an agreement is the only way to open up the possibility of movement toward the normalization of relations between Israel and the other countries in the region, most of whom share a deep fear and concern about the threat to them from Iran. The Palestinians also face very serious problems, especially, of course, the indefinite continuation of the occupation under which they do not have the right to govern themselves. In 1947, the United Nations proposed a plan to partition the area into two states. Israel accepted it. The Arabs rejected it. And in 1948, the first of several wars began, all of them won by an increasingly strong Israel. Every sensible Arab leader today would gladly accept the 1947-48 plan if it were still available. But it is not available, and it never again will be, because the circumstances on the ground have changed so dramatically. Since then, the plans offered to the Palestinians have been less attractive, and they've rejected them all. But as I told Chairman Arafat directly on several occasions on my first tour of duty in the region, and I told President Abbas directly on several occasions in my most recent tour of duty, there is no evidence, none whatsoever, to suggest that the offers are going to get any better in the future. They have got to sit down, participate in, and stay in direct negotiations and get the best deal they can, even though it's not 100% of what they want. They've got to bring the occupation to an end, get their own state, and build on it. Prime Minister Fayyad, an outstanding leader, tried to lay the foundation by building the institutions needed for a viable, independent state. But he's gone, and the state-building effort cannot be sustained in the absence of progress on the political side. They are inextricably linked. It's a complicated issue, and it just recently got more complicated. The Palestinian Authority and Hamas announced just a few days ago that they've agreed to form a unity government within five weeks and to schedule elections within six months. Now, these discussions have been going on for seven years. In 2011 and 2012, almost identical announcements of reconciliation were made by the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. On both occasions, they were unable to agree, either on a unity government or in elections, and the efforts collapsed. So we can't yet tell whether this agreement will stick or whether it too will fail. Until there is some clarity, the immediate impact will be negative. Unless Hamas agrees to the conditions laid down years ago by the US and the European Union, under which they must commit to nonviolence, recognize Israel, and accept previous agreements. It's a daunting challenge to, resume, to regain trust, not just among leaders, but among two different societies with a long and bitter history of conflict. But they have to find a way to renew hope and to see that peace must prevail and we must persevere in helping them, tired as many Americans and others have become of the difficulties in the region. And I hope Senator Ker uh, Secretary Kerry continues his strong and commendable efforts. Now, I want to finish up by going back to talking about the challenges that we face in our own country. Uh, I do believe that as far into the future as human beings can see, the United States will be a strong and dominant power. But we also face many challenges, and I'll briefly mention just a few. First, we must never lose sight of the reality that military power and world influence are grounded in economic strength. It's the foundation upon which all else is built. We must somehow find a way to get our political and financial houses in order. 
that's a whole nother speech. We'll have to come back in a couple of years and give that one. I can't give it tonight, but it's an urgent need that we all recognize. Second, we must be true to our principles. It is, in fact, our ideals that distinguish our nation from the very beginning. And they appeal to people all around the world, then and now. Our economic strength and military power are necessary and important, but our ideals have been and remain the primary basis of American influence in the world. They're not easily summarized, but surely they include the sovereignty of the people, the primacy of individual liberty, opportunity for every member of society, an independent judiciary, and the rule of law applied equally to all citizens and crucially to the government itself. We, nor anyone else, must ever forget that the United States was a great nation long before it was a great military or economic power. The United States was a great nation from the very beginning when there were fewer than four million people huddled along the Atlantic seaboard. Third, we must be careful and restrained in foreign military interventions. As large and strong, as wealthy as is our nation, we do not have the capacity to solve every problem in the world. In the turbulence of this century, we will be asked over and over again to militarily intervene in other lands to resolve complex disputes. Many of the requests will be heartrending and persuasive, but all must be measured through the prism of our national interest. Because if we start intervening military, militarily everywhere, we will soon lose the capacity to intervene anywhere. There are, of course, many other tools we can and should use to help our friends and to protect our interests. Diplomatic, economic, financial, technological, even covert actions. It's easy to say these words. It's extraordinarily difficult to apply them to real life situations, especially those that we cannot now foresee. That will be the great challenge for American leadership in the coming decades. And finally, we must work to realize the aspiration of opportunity for every member of society. And I close as I began with another personal story. As I said at the outset, I served as a federal judge in my home state of Maine. Among the many powers I had, and the one which I most enjoyed, was when I presided over what are called naturalization ceremonies. They're citizenship ceremonies. A group of people who'd come from all over the world, who'd gone through all of the required procedures, gathered before me in a federal courtroom in Maine. There, I administered to them the oath of allegiance to the United States. And by the power vested in me under our law, I made them. Americans. It was always a very emotional ceremony for me because my mother was an immigrant from Lebanon, my father the orphan son of immigrants from Ireland. Neither of my parents had any education. My mother could not read or write and she worked for 50 years on the night shift at textile mills in rural Maine. My father was a janitor. But because of their efforts, and more importantly, because of the openness of American society, I, their son, was able to get an education and to go on to become the majority leader of the United States Senate. After every ceremony, I made it a point to speak personally with each of the new Americans, individually and in family groups. I asked them where they came from, why they came, how they came. Their stories were all inspiring. Most of us in this room are Americans by an accident of birth. All of them are Americans by an act of free will, often at great risk and cost to themselves. Although the answers were in many ways as different as the countries of origin, there were some common themes. And they were best summarized by a young Asian man who when I asked him why he came, replied in slow and very halting English. I came, he said, because in America, everybody has a chance. Think about the fact that a young man who had been an American for 10 minutes, who could barely speak English, was able to sum up the meaning of our country in a single sentence. 
America is freedom and opportunity. Ours is a society in which no one should be guaranteed success, but every single one should have a fair chance to succeed. Our challenge is to make that aspiration a reality. Thank you very much for having me. And Noel's asked me to take some questions. I'll be glad to do so. I'm not going to begin with the traditional warning not to give speeches. If you want to give a speech, feel free to do so. <laughs> if you want to ask a question, do that too. Go ahead. But you've got to speak up, whatever you do, because I only got one good Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful speech. I don't think Dr. Kissinger would, would, would equal it, <laughs> though his accent make him come close. Uh, I want to uh, ask you, you made a very important statement about Muslims and the violence that you see over the horizon. And in that you mentioned the Sunni-Shia divide. I mentioned what? The Sunni-Shia divide. Yeah, right. and, and you kind of put that as a pivot for some of the violence. And in a moment I'm going to ask you what you base that on. But let me tell you why I asked the question, because as you know, two-thirds of Muslims don't live in the Middle East. They live in Asia. A third of the Muslims live in the Middle East. In Asia, there is a very long record of Sunni Shia marriages in Pakistan, in India, in Malaysia, in Indonesia. In the Middle East, that tussle is a lot stronger. And it's the viewpoint is that Iran and Saudi Arabia are the two pivots on which that... So my question to you is, what do you base your assertion that the Sunni-Shia divide is going to cause the violence? Could it not be something as simple as the power play between Saudi Arabia and Iran? Uh, nowhere did I say that the Sunni-Shia divide will cause violence. What I pointed out is that it is one of many factors, growing populations, the other nature of the uh, internal uh, Islamic divide, demand for resources, poor governance, corruption, all of those will contribute to violence. But I think it unmistakable that it is a factor. I'm aware, of course, that of the one 0.2 billion Muslims in the world today, only about 400 million are Arab, and two-thirds are outside of it. But you yourself mentioned Pakistan. There are terrific internal stresses within Pakistan. It's themselves partially Sunni Shia that we read about almost every day. You did not mention Iraq. We're all aware of the extent to which violence is spiraling in Iraq as the election approaches, and they are to a significant degree based on Sunni-Shia differences, as are the differences in Syria, where now nearly 150,000 people have died. I'm very well aware about uh, Indonesia because I spent many years working there. It's, it's the largest Muslim country, and they do have, I think, they have successfully established a, a viable democracy in a relatively short time following a long history of authoritarian rule. Even there, there are internal divisions as there are uh, increasing differences, not on the Sunni-Shia lines, but on the other line I mentioned between those who want a theocratic state and those who do not. So I think the points I made in the manner that I made them are valid and are not in dispute with the comments that you made. Two-thirds of Muslims don't live in the Middle East, but, and these factors are, are not exclusive to contributing to what I think will be rising turbulence, but they do contribute to them. And finally, India, of course, which after uh, Indonesia is the second largest Muslim population in the world. And we are all well aware of the internal religious differences within India, which continue to flare up from time to time, although they are not Sunni Shia, they are Hindu, uh, Muslim are related and everybody with any knowledge of history is aware of the tremendous stresses that accompanied 
the independence of the Indian subcontinent, the division into India and Pakistan, and then Pakistan into, from Pakistan, East and West Pakistan into Pakistan and Bangladesh. So I think if you look at it, uh, it's a combination of factors, among which those I mentioned uh, are, do contribute to it, but no one of which is an exclusive cause. And, and they vary tremendously from country to country, because the countries themselves have different historical backgrounds. Thank you, Senator Mitchell, for uh, comprehensive and an inspiring presentation. As you are well aware, the Middle East peace process now is in a pause, despite, Senator, uh, despite uh, Secretary of State Kerry's intensive efforts. What, in your view, would it take to break the deadlock specifically? Thank you. Well, what I said here publicly, <laughs> I said privately to President Abbas and to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, and while they both regularly nodded <laughs> while I spoke, uh, neither committed themselves to acting upon my recommendations. I think in part the reason is because of the level of mistrust, both personal and political. I think uh, both leaders doubt the intention and the capacity of the other. In fact, I can say to you that several times when I made this similar or even more expansive comments, Prime Minister Netanyahu would take me by the arm and he would point out the window and he would say, I'm very serious, is he? I think pointing in the vaguely general direction of Ramallah. And then the same day I would drive to Ramallah, I would go meet with the President of Abbas, I would make this same pitch and he would take my other arm and say, I'm, I'm really serious, I'm gonna get this done, but is he pointing in the general direction of Jerusalem? So I think you have a circumstance where neither side believes in the intention of the other or in the capacity of the other given their different domestic political circumstances. And make no mistake about it, this will be extremely difficult politically for any leader in both societies because they remain on both sides aggressive groups who are adamantly opposed to a two-state solution and who regularly and routinely criticize the leaders for making these efforts and will, of course, criticize them harshly for any concession. We, we uh, I want to give a, make a general comment that isn't limited to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. We believe strongly in a free press. And there is no doubt that it is absolutely essential to the preservation of a functioning democracy. But like almost all things human, it is not just an unmitigated blessing. There can be advantages and disadvantages. The advantages far outweigh the disadvantages, but it doesn't mean there are no disadvantages. And one of them is it's very difficult to engage in processes of this type in full public view. I, I, I'll leave the Middle East to tell you about Northern Ireland. I was there five years. We, we had negotiations in a, in a British government compound, uh, basically a government office building had been renovated as a, as a venue for the peace talks. There were fence and gates and troops and we were very safe. But right outside the gate, there was a huge press contingent. And every day the delegates of peace talks would walk in and they'd be confronted. Well, here, look, look in the paper what your opposition said last night. You'll never agree to that, will you? You'd never agree to such a ridiculous position as that. And the same thing on the way out. Back and forth every day. It got to the point when during one of the negotiating processes I was involved in, both sides came to me and said, we, we'll never make progress. We have to have some mechanism for doing this outside 
of the country where we're not going to be subjected to this every day back and forth. And y you know, it gets a bad in the talks. I, I constantly told them stories about the U.S. Senate uh, to amuse them and, and, <laughs> and to establish my own credentials. And what I told them is that the Senate has something called the morning hour. Uh, it originated as a rule that permitted people to get up and give speeches on any subject they wanted. And there's an hour devoted to it. And in Northern Ireland, there was so much contention back and forth about what was on the television news last night, what was in the morning papers, that I said, I think we should have morning hour here. I said, so we'll come in in the morning and you guys go ahead and let it all out. And then maybe after an hour or two, we can get to the subject matter. It's very tough to do. And, and one of the problems is because there is a determined opposition in both societies, at the first hint of a concession by either side, why they're attacked vigorously by the naysayers in their own society. It, this it would be, you would have a much better chance if you could have a hermetically sealed process so the first public disclosure is of a full agreement in which there are concessions on both sides. Well, that's impossible, of course. So you do the best you can in the circumstances. And you struggle to try to get political leaders with the courage and the vision to be willing to argue for concessions, although they have to produce success. When I'm the, I drafted the peace agreement in Northern Ireland, and I was aware that the delegates were all politicians. They were all members of parliament, elected people. I myself had been a politician, and I had to draft a document that everybody could take out and hold up to their constituents and say, look what we got. Now, Everybody had to say that, which means that there were some parts of it each side liked and some they didn't like, but you had to give everybody enough positive to emphasize for their groups. You have to do the same thing in the Middle East and everywhere else. Now, the problem is that the greatest benefit of all is peace. It's a sense of physical security. But that benefits everyone. It's general. It's diffuse. People want it. But then they ask, yeah, but well, we know about peace, but really, what are we getting? What tangible, what specific? And getting to that level is very difficult. So I think it's hard on these leaders, but I think eventually it's going to happen because I believe that the disadvantages of not reaching agreement will be so substantial in both societies that they will see it if nothing else, as a way out of the problems that are generated by not having an agreement. Wait, wait for the mic. Thank you for your remarks. Um, I'm not going to make a speech out of my questions, but I have two very short questions. And you may answer whichever one you want, or, you do, or both. Uh, number one is, uh, what do you specifically think of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, your specific view? And number two, I'm a, I'm a Russian Jew who has been naturalized <laughs> here, so I'm one of the minority, and I practice immigration law and specifically international adoptions. So um, there has been, uh, been a law passed in Russia, the anti-adoption law, and what, do you think that that law was, had something to this purely legal issue that Russia deals with, or was it, uh, was it politically motivated? That's it. Well, uh, let, me, uh, let me answer the uh, first part of the question. Um, there is, of course, and you would know this better than I, I'm, I'm, you know more about the subject than I do, inevitably a profound sense of loss and defeat among many Russians following the Cold War. The, the, the feeling that they won and we didn't, that exists in every conflict, violent or otherwise. And uh, Prime Minister Putin himself, uh, President Putin himself has said on many occasions that he regards the demise of the Soviet Union as the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. And he has plainly stated his intention to rebuild uh, Russian influence at least in the areas that directly abut Russia, which he calls New Russia, and which 
many call the near abroad. Uh, but I think that the methods being employed are, are illegal and uh, violate international law and of course uh, do not represent the views of the majority of Ukrainians. There clearly are many in, U in the Ukraine who speak Russian and want to be part of Russia. But that was one of the dangerous legacies of the Second World War. The fact is, of course, that in almost every country in Europe, there are various minorities. There are, in fact, more Ukrainians in Russia than there are Russian-speaking Ukrainians in Ukraine. Now, they haven't risen up and said they want to detach some part of Russia back to Ukraine, but there are minorities all over the place, and I think it's a very dangerous precedent to through force and the threat of force to create a circumstance in which uh, sovereign nations can, uh, the borders of which can be violated with impunity. Uh, I don't think that it is likely, or in fact, the president has said there won't be the use of force. That's consistent with the past 50 years. Uh, we didn't intervene in Hungary, we didn't intervene in Czechoslovakia, we didn't intervene in other countries uh, uh, where uh, the Soviets established their authority by force. But I do think that it will be a very costly, as I said, and sh relatively short-lived uh, triumph uh, for President Putin and for Russia. And I think the cost will be very substantial. Now, one of the things they have going for them is the only way to effectively combat this, absent the use of force, is through economic sanctions. But there is no way to impose sanctions on Russia without those who do the imposing suffering some burden themselves. It's relatively easy for Americans who don't do much business with Russia to be actively seeking the strongest possible sanctions. It's much more difficult for the Europeans most notably the Germans who have extensive trade uh, with Russia, so it's no surprise that the in intensity of support for sanctions is inverse to the amount of trade that a particular country does with Russia. I do think, though, that there will be sanctions. They will have some effect, perhaps not the maximum degree, and combined with the severe economic problems that Russia is going to face as the price of oil declines, uh, I think it, it will not be a good result for the uh, current government. Now, on the last part of your question about adoptions, uh, I, I honestly don't know enough about the subject to give you an intelligent response. So I'll respond with a story. Uh, Many years ago as a young man, I was practicing law in Portland, Maine, and a friend of mine called me and he, he said that a, a man who was running for President of the United States was appearing in Portland as, that night to speak and answer questions. Would I like to go with him? I said, yes. So I went and we went and heard this presidential candidate who spoke at length and then in the question and answer period answered at great length every question. And when we walked out, I said to my friend, what did you think? He said, just once I would have been impressed if he had said an answer to a question I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Senator Mitchell, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to hear you this evening. I was very touched by your ending story, your closing story as a naturalized citizen from uh, originating from Cyprus. I have two questions for you. The first one is about the European Union. Can you comment on your perspective on, on the European Union with regards to its, all of its economic issues and high unemployment and, and internal problems with, for example, in England or the UK wanting to, to detach from the Union, etc. And the second part of the question is, how do you see the role of Turkey with regards to its accession to the, its willingness to be part of the European Union, and also its role in the broader Middle East? Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's human and it's natural to focus on bad things and not good things. 
I, I, I'll never forget when I was Senate Majority Leader, I worked for years to pass the Clean Air Act. And it literally took years and we had negotiated and struggled and we got about 90% there and then the Washington Post ran a huge front page story which was entirely devoted to the issues that we hadn't resolved. <laughs> and didn't mention the other. So I confronted the reporter. I said, you know, gee, we're working hard. You, you write a story about all, he said, listen, Senator, you will never see a headline in the Washington Post that says, two million commuters made it safely to work today. <laughs> he said, you will see plenty of headlines that says six people killed in car crash. And that's just the reality. But about the European Union, just think about for a moment about history. In the 75 years prior to 1945, three major land wars devastated Europe. Nation against nation. We are sh rightly shocked and horrified when we read about 10, 12, 20, 30 people being killed by a bomb. But think about this. In the First and Second World Wars combined, nearly 75 million people died in countries whose populations was much smaller than they are today. So the proportionate toll was incredible. And in part, I believe, it was the creation of the European Union and other post-World War II institutions, which the United States helped and led the way toward, that have resulted in that. They're having economic stresses. They've made mistakes. But if you look back, the overarching principle was a desire to embed the nations of Europe into economic, political, and military organizations from which it would be very difficult for one country to break out and attack and try to solve problems by force. So you create a non-war alternative to solving problems. It doesn't mean that the alternative is going to solve every problem. In fact, it doesn't even mean that the alternative is going to create some new problems because it's a fact of human life that the solution to every problem contains within itself the seeds of a new problem. But look at Europe from 1870 to 1945 and look at Europe from 1945 to 2014. What an incredible difference. All because of the willingness, the leadership of some great men and women, but also the willingness of people to focus on the benefits of peace. So, I, I don't have the solution to Europe's financial problems, the monetary union, which plainly has created some great stresses. But I speak in Europe often, and I try to remind them of of what a good job they've done, how great they've been, how much better their society and what positive contributors they are to the world now. If you take the union as a whole, of course, with the China and the United States, one of three great groups of consumers in the world and producers. So I'm, I'm, I strongly support the European Union. I strongly believe that it would be a profound error for the United Kingdom to withdraw both from the standpoint of stability in Europe and in the interests of the people of the UK themselves. We believe in democracy and they will decide their future and decide for themselves. I don't presume to speak for them or to them, but I do express my opinion. They've benefited along with everybody else. There has been a major land war in Europe, nation versus nation, for, for a very long time. And, and we have a tendency to take for granted the benefits of peace which I don't think should be taken for granted because as we can see, it's easy for people to slip into old and bad habits. And one of the dangers of the, what's happening in the Ukraine is the possibility that somebody will get overextended. What happens if the Russians succeed in destabilizing and breaking up Ukraine if they try the same in the Baltic states, which have large Russian-speaking minorities in their populations? How far, how far to the West do they go? Are they emboldened by success? Those are all unanswerable questions, but they're all concerns. As far as Turkey goes, I think the EU made a profound error, led by the French government to its, uh, I believe, misfortune to reject or not to accept Turkey, to make it tough for Turkey to get into the European Union. 
just at the moment that the Turks were, their economy was rising, their national confidence was growing, they made clear their desire to become part of the Western society of nations, and they were rejected. So human nature being what it is, they turned to the East. And they then sought to extend their authority uh, and influence in that region. It's natural, they're, they're part of the region. They have competition there from Iran, from Egypt, all three nations of roughly the same size. Uh, they all have their problems. I think we ought to be very mindful and respectful of the history of Turkey and particularly in the last uh, uh, century, its ability to create a modern democratic society now threatened internally and externally, but nonetheless seen across the full sweep of history, uh, a large accomplishment. And I hope that the European, the leaders of the European Union will recognize the era of their judgment and, and make an effort to welcome Turkey in to the uh, Western nations. Here's the look. Thank you all very much. <laughs>